Welcome back, everyone, to SuperCloud 7. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE here in Palo Alto with Dave Vellante, co-founder uh, of theCUBE and SiliconANGLE. Our keynote fireside chat is with Ali Godsey, CEO and co-founder of Databricks. He's here with us, calling in remotely. Ali, thank you so much for coming in. Um, in SuperCloud 7, the confluence of cloud, now data platforms. Getting the next data platform right is really the focus, and the survey of all surveys has come out with the Cube Research team for the first time that shows what we've been saying in the market and you've been saying publicly and privately around how the platformization of data, hence the data lake, all the bets you've made with Databricks is happening. So a, a big movement, real clear data and a sign and coexistence by the way, between multiple markets. So it's a growing market. So great to have you on. Thanks for, for coming on for this keynote chat. Yeah, thank you. Excited to be here. So first thing I want to ask you is obviously you just came off your event. You made some great statements. You highlighted small language models, which I thought was interesting, but also you made a comment that said, don't trust all your data in one platform, including Databricks, which I thought was interesting yep. because you're saying, even us don't trust your data. And then of course, the open data formats are coming. You guys shipping GA and a lot more action. Open, developer, heterogeneous was the theme, as well as the democratization. Obviously that was all kind of table stakes, but heterogeneous, open, big part of that. Now you're seeing the data come out with the survey that, you know, platformization is happening. This is what you've been saying. What's your reaction to the data? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, it's, you know, we, we've been seeing it in our accounts for years now, for a couple of years. Um, you know, it's interesting, why is it happening now? Because we, honestly, we've been saying this for many, many more years. We didn't actually start seeing momentum uh, until just, I would say in the last year or two. Um, I think what has happened is that CIOs, and IT departments, but also business leaders in line of business, they just feel like there's cost pressures. So they have to lower their cost basis, right? And it's they're spending so much on their tech stacks, on their clouds, but also on their data platforms. And they're seeing this cost of these data platforms go up over the years, and they just have to get that cost down. In many cases, they're facing a decision of, if I don't reduce the cost of my data platforms and my cloud spend, I might have to let people go. And I much prefer spending less on software than letting people go, right? So that's like trend number one that's happening everywhere. And reality is they have so many different data platforms. They have so many different tools. Most leaders you talk to, if you go high up enough, they say, look, I don't even know what half of these things do. We just seem to have bought one of each over the years. And I just need to consolidate. I need to platformize. I just want one thing or maybe two things. Okay, I made a short list of three, four vendors and you're one of them and I want to talk to you and I want to settle it down and then we just standardize on you guys and maybe usually typically there's another cloud vendor in there. And you know, so it's a top list. And then I just want to kind of, I don't even know what, we can't have all these things. It costs too much money. I need to do that. So that's why we said, yeah, you know, don't give your data to Databricks. Don't give your data to Snowflake. Don't give your data to anyone else. Own your own data. Otherwise you're just building yet another silo. You know, we can tell you it's going to be great if you give me all your data, but the truth is that's just another silo. So own it, store it in the lake in an open format where you uh, can decide then to bring in whichever engine is best on top of that open data that's your data, okay? Mm -hmm. And then over time, vendors, it could be us, it could be someone else can come in and they have to prove themselves. Can they actually operate on that data and bring you value? If they can, great, use them. If not, bring in someone else but you don't have to now migrate the data yeah. from one data platform to another data platform and so on. And so this is music to their ears and not to mention, it also lowers the cost significantly so they can get that TCO reduction and keep their teams intact. So yeah. that's what's happening. So it's top of mind. By the way, I've said the same thing even four or five years ago. Yeah. The problem was customers were then saying, well, who cares about cutting my costs? Yeah. You know, in the ZERP era, I have a lot of projects I want to take on. Like who cares about spending, you know, a little bit less here and there, but that's shifted now. Yeah, I, I'm, we probably have that on the cube tape too, but I think also your point about streaming and the data lake is expensive too. All kinds of things in the lake could give you operating leverage. You mentioned a few of them. I want to get your thoughts because open formats is one. You mentioned engines, you got engines and formats. Now multiple engines. I think the statement you guys were making was, hey, many engines have them, run them anywhere. So the focus on open formats and engine uh, interoperability, and then governance is hot as, as hell right now because people are shifting there. So the catalogs are hugely popular, not just owning the data or letting someone own it on your behalf, the catalogs, and then three, spend. Those are the three things that are hot right now, open formats and engines, cataloging and governance, and spend direction. 
where are you going to direct the spend? What's your reaction to those three? You talked about performance already. Talk about the governance, cataloging, and strategic nature of that. And then where are people directing their spend? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say a few years ago when we started pushing this, um, first the initial reaction was like, look, I don't need to necessarily lower my costs. But that's shifted. After ZERP, after 2021, 2022, the cost pressures are everyone, everywhere. So everyone wants to consolidate less tools, less silos, less lock-in, let me own my data, and let me get that cost down. But then the number one thing we heard, maybe it was about three years ago, was, okay, but if I'm going to consolidate all my data in one platform, like, how do I secure all this stuff? How do I govern it? And governance is not just security. It's not just access control. It's also just understanding the cost structures. It's also about sharing. It's about collaboration. It's all of these. And I want to do it for all my data sets and data assets. So that's why uh, we started focusing, I would say, three, four years ago on what we call Unity Catalog, which is our governance solution. It's called Unity because it unifies not just data, but also your AI models. So it also brings in AI into the equation and also your uh, dashboards and also your notebooks and also your unstructured data. So it's not just about tables and so on. It's any data you might have. And that's why you know that started taking off. But then Gen AI happened, right? And when Gen AI happened, I would say two years ago, uh, there's huge demand for, I want all my data, unstructured data. I care a lot about my AI models. I care a lot about governance of AI. I'm super worried about privacy, security of my AI and my data. So AI has now been added to this equation and Unity Catalog is a catalog for all of those data assets, not just for the tables. And that's what makes it unique in the market, right? Uh, so then we started about, you know, I would say two, three quarters ago, working on open sourcing this project, which we just announced uh, about a quarter ago that its project is open source. And we've seen further momentum now that people are adopting it because it's open source, they can deploy it on premise, they can deploy it in other environments, they don't need to worry about lock-in, they don't need to worry about lock-in of their data because that's an open format, but they also don't need to worry about the lock-in of their governance because that's also now open APIs and open catalogs. So that's what I would say is the second uh, big important decision and factor that I see with enterprises, um, I mentioned AI, that's, that's the other big one. Yeah. So Ali, it seems like every June we, we learn more, we have to sort of reset uh, our assumptions and expectations and we have different conversations, thanks in a large part to the moves that you make at Data Plus AI Summit. So last year you made some big moves, like you said, Mate on stage, open sourced uh, Unity, uh, and then the, you acquired Tabular. So what is the reaction been, and, and specifically, one of the things in our survey that was interesting was about 30% said, yeah, we're comfortable managing our own silos. And our premise is because they don't have a better way to, to bust those silos. And that's obviously the mission that you're on. But so what has the, the reaction been? Um, and, and specifically, what are your plans uh, with Tabular? Yeah, uh, the reaction is a little surprising. Um, you know, we, we speculated in advance, you know, and we had all these different models of how the industry is going to re react to this. Uh, I would say, um, you know, I, I'm a paranoid CEO, so <laughs> I would say I've been very positively surprised to see that in our customer base, they love it. I mean, they were cheering and even customers that, you know, or pr prospects that we haven't talked to for years because, you know, sometimes, you know, there's some prospects that, uh, you know, they, they have, you know, maybe they're on-prem, they have constraints they wanted to talk to us and said, this is like the greatest thing they've heard. They're super excited to see interoperability between these formats. They don't want to see incompatibility between Delta Lake and Iceberg. So the fact that we're unifying them in project uniform, and now you can get both of those and you get full compatibility of your data, they loved it. Uh, so I was a little bit surprised actually that it was so uniformly positive from the customer base and how positive it was. That definitely surprised me and you know uh, many of the other key decision makers behind Databricks that, uh, that you know, we're working on this acquisition for a while. Uh, the other thing that's a little bit surprising is that many vendors, and I'm not going to mention names, seemed almost freaked out about it. And that was a real surprise to me because I, I thought that, no, this is how markets are, you know, people have all things. And I sincerely thought that bringing interoperability between these two formats is going to help the industry because, you know, it essentially expands the TAM for everybody involved, right? Let the best engine win. That, let the best engine me win means all the engines can participate, right? So you, if you have an engine, bring it in here and show me if it works on the data, right? And the data, it'll work on any data because we're integrating them and we're making them interoperable. Whereas if we hadn't done this, you would be siloed into the just iceberg camp or just to the Delta camp. Uh, so I thought there would be much more, uh, 
you know, th this makes sense for the industry and it's good for them, but there's been absolute freak out, uh, you know, a couple of the vendors, yeah. uh, like almost <laughs> state of shock. Like, and, uh, and so we had to actually kind of spend a lot of energy uh, and try to explain to them that, you know, this is really, really good for the industry. Yeah. Just listen to the customers. They love it. They love the fact that with Uniform, you now get both Iceberg, you get both Delta, That'll be good for everyone. It's open source. It'll actually expand the TAM for all of us and it'll bring a lot of customer value. So I think now they're in a good or better place. Um, but uh, yeah, so that well, the data, the data, surprising. the data shows that, Ali, the data shows here, I'll read the stat here. Um, when asked who's moving what within the shared accounts, you're getting bulk of the movement. I think you have 36% movement over the accounts of new workloads within Snowflake. They're taking a little bit of yours. It's just so there's movement going around, that's natural. But what's interesting is both your companies have very, very low single digit churn. The stickiness is off the charts. The loyalty is there. Now, but there's different workloads, but this brings up the question of strategic intent and workloads. And if you look at the questions that came on here, the one question I'll read to you was, and I think Dave wrote this was awesome, um, both Databricks and Snowflake have made big investments to be a platform on which organizations can build their generative AI applications. How much do you, you agree or disagree with the following statements? Statement number one, Databricks approach is more appealing because of their historical expertise in machine learning and their more open model, 64%. Huge numbers, congratulations. That's working, check. Snowflake's approach is more appealing because of its deep integration, 49%. Hyperscale cloud providers have more capabilities in the air than either Databricks or Snowflake, 34%. Now, okay, you win on the percentage, but it's pretty, that's a TAM thing. It's a rising tide. So workloads will define that. Can you comment on the, I mean, it's very nuanced data, but one, you're leaning more towards Databricks, so that's a bigger number, that's earned. Snowflake has a great position in analytics. Okay, they got a good number. Even hyperscale is 34%. Everybody's winning in the TAM expansion, as you pointed out. Talk about the workload impact, because that's where the battles will be won and fought and where compute will change, where the resources will be adjusted at the infrastructure level. Can you share your thoughts that, on that? Yeah, I just think that, you know, it really kind of started, this trend started maybe 15 years ago or 20 years ago, actually, with the cloud. Uh, when SaaS came along, it, you know, unlike on-premise where you were locked in and it would take many years to migrate the workloads, you could more easily switching costs kind of were reduced. Mm -hmm. But in the data space, data has gravity. That's the saying always, and it's sticky. Uh, but what has happened is with this open formats and now with the acquisition of Tableau, and by the way, I have to say, Ryan and team behind Tableau, they're amazing. You know, it's, that's been another surprise of you know, how awesome that team is. Uh, and also the strategy they had with the Tableau actually, not just the iceberg format. Uh, but with that, now formats are not anymore a lock-in. So some of that data gravity is actually being reduced. And then with the governance being open source as well, and the you know, standard emerging for how you actually do governance, it's just much less locking. So this trend continues where we can get more people being able to switch. When they switch, they'll be able to actually pick the best engine or the best platform or the best sort of application that gives them value for their data. Uh, that means more customers are going to be successful. That means we're going to see increased spend um, you know, over long periods of time. So that's what's happening. I actually think it's going to, this is going to be better for everybody involved. Um, of course, now the big question on everybody's mind, you know, if you talk to any, any CEO, they'll of course say, I want to cut my costs. But the second thing they say, we have to get Gen AI in my company. Yeah. My company needs Gen AI. Innovation. And there's this food fight now going on inside a big enterprise. If you go to a large corporation, okay, the board and the CEO has said Gen AI is super important to them. The different business leaders underneath, they're fighting. You know, I own Gen AI. No, 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 I own Gen AI. No, <laughs> Gen AI is essential to what I'm doing. You know, this is, yeah. I, this is gonna make my career here. Yeah. Uh, so everybody wants Gen AI. Um, and, you know, I think people got maybe a little bit overexcited last year that, you know, they were gonna build Gen AI and they were gonna get amazing results and they would be done, one and done. Uh, but, you know, it takes a longer time. This is a big paradigm shift. So uh, I think for last year, um, my joke is everybody was just building, it's kind of like when the iPhone came out and every organization needed to build iPhone apps. So they built lots of iPhone apps, but a lot of those iPhone apps were sort of like flashlight applications. Yeah. Uh, and later iPhone just released with a flashlight built in. Um, I think what's happening now last year was lots of people building just chatbots. Yeah. Very simple rag chatbots. 
And now they're realizing, okay, maybe that's not the biggest value for my enterprise, for my business. So I think they're now they're taking a step back and thinking, what are the most strategic projects for Gen AI that we need to build? And they're starting to realize that they need the AI to really understand the data that they have. Their data advantage is going to be key. Anyone can build a chatbot. You can build a chatbot, I can build a chatbot. But if I have specific data in my enterprise, because I have customer relations that no one else has, and I have this data set in my enterprise, uh, that's really valuable. If I can get the Gen AI to accurately and faithfully, without hallucinating, really answer questions on my proprietary data. By the way, I'm very protective over my data. I need the privacy of it uh, to be guaranteed. I need the security of it because there's cyber attacks. People are trying to hack in. There's, you know, there's attacks announced every day. So I need to really protect that yeah. data. But if the AI could just answer questions on my data, that would be super valuable. Can you help me build that? And that's what we call data intelligence. Data intelligence is uh, intelligence on your data, not just a chatbot that can answer questions about, you know, uh, what happened in the Second World War, was there election <laughs> fraud in 2020, or you know, something controversial, and it gives you politically correct answers. Um, but rather, you know, uh, what's the forecast for my revenue actually tomorrow, based on all these very confidential data sets that I have internally in my enterprise? That's what everybody's doing, and. That's the top focus now. Help me build that. And they're starting to realize that might take a little bit more effort than just plug and play an LLM. Real. And you just call an API and it just works. Uh, real, That's no, going to take more investment. Dave, Dave wants to ask a question, but I want to get one follow up real quick before Dave gets in there. Yeah. On that point about the data, yeah. the data you just mentioned, how would you peg the progress of how programmable is the data from developer standpoint? Programmability. So yeah. asset check, I got that. What's your quick quick assessment of, are they programming with data right now? What's the status of that in your mind? Yeah, I would say that no, it, they weren't. That's why we actually put the whole blog out. We call it Compound AI Systems. Is research that my co-founder, who's a, a professor at Berkeley, Matei Zaharia, put out. And uh, we think that with Compound AI Systems, these are a little bit more complex systems that you can actually program and it can actually use agents and it can become much more programmable and you can get faithful answers on your data that's possible if you build those, but those are a little bit more complex systems okay. that you have to build. So one way to think about it is if you're building your own self-driving car, would you just call an LLM API and be done? Or is that actually a more sophisticated system? You need LIDAR, you need many agents, you need checks and balances. I think the future of AI inside the enterprise looks more like that. That's what we call compound AI systems. So this is gets to the value point. So one of the premises we put out in the CUBE research is that the, the point of control is shifting away from the database management system to the governance catalog, but the point of value, because you're open sourcing, uh, Snowflake's open sourcing, at least the technical metadata, the source of value is actually leapfrogging that to building applications, um, you, leveraging multiple tool chains uh, with AI, even agentic AI, and building intelligent yeah. data apps on, on top of data platforms. So we, we've been pushing this notion. So when I wrote the breaking analysis last weekend, uh, uh, somebody commented, yeah, but data platform vendors have never really succeeded in, in being application uh, platforms. And I said, well, AWS has actually done a pretty good job of it, but uh, how do you think about the premise of that value shift and your, your and your competitors' chances of becoming that new application platform with intelligent data apps? Yeah, actually I think of it, uh, I, I would say, think of it this way, um, to use these data platforms in the past, uh, you had to have certain level of technical proficiency, right? You, you had to either know SQL or you know Python. Maybe you were a developer. You need to know something. You couldn't just show up and build these things. And I think with Gen AI now, we have the opportunity actually to broaden this. If you speak English or your mother tongue, you can just program these things, right? That's where we're headed. It's not there right now. It's not like, okay, if you speak English, you can build any computer system. Uh, but we're getting closer and closer to that. That's what we call data intelligence, right? So with that kind of data intelligence, we can start democratizing access to data and AI. So much broader group within the enterprise can actually build their own Gen AI apps and also get, get just ask basic questions from the data. You know, the truth is today, a CEO of a Fortune 500 company can't actually ask questions from the data themselves. If they have a specific question, you know, what was my revenue for this product line yesterday? They have to ask a data team to get that data. They can't ask it themselves. But I think with the Gen AI, we now have the opportunity to do that, to actually be able to enable them to do that. And I think that also expands the TAM and brings much more business value uh, to the space. So I'm very excited about that too. I think Gen AI has you know, huge, tremendous opportunity in front of us. Um, also, if you think of it this way, 
in the past, we had these SaaS systems of record applications, you know, Salesforce, NetSuite, Workday, you know, there was a whole slew of them, right? But with Gen AI now, more and more, the data and AI portion of it becomes more important. So more and more, uh, I think the center of gravity is going to shift towards the data and AI that you have built in, rather than the app that you're building around it. The app becomes less important. You're just going to speak to it. So the particular UIs and how things look like won't matter that much. Even the shape of the data doesn't matter so much because the Gen AI is under, able to understand it, right? So the key thing then is going to become how strong is your data and AI capability. So I think on the contrary, many of these apps of the future, the center of gravity is going to be the data and AI platform under, under the hood. Of course, we need to change certain things, uh, us data platforms uh, to enable that. But I think that that's where the future lies. I think we're going to reimagine mm -hmm a software as a service and all these applications with data and AI at their core. And therefore, I think all the companies on the planet will basically become data and AI companies. Ali, I want to get your thoughts. We talked about the open data stuff um, and the integration is going to be key. If you read the fine print on these engines uh, and format relationships, by the way, I think there's going to be multiple engines out there and standards will help that. So we're totally with you on that. There's a lot of fine print. Oh, it reads, but doesn't it doesn't write. So it got some write, some read. So, you assume compute's going to accelerate in, in, in capabilities. Maybe that gap closes on how fast you can manage the who can read and write and how that gets translated. But I want to ask you about the adoption question. When, how, do you, how would you measure success from a de facto standard, from an open um, data format adoption? Right now the survey shows, our, our future of data platform survey shows 18% of adopted open formats, which is a good number, not a bad number. 70% are evaluating it. So that we're watching mm -hmm. this very closely because this is where the fallacy of open versus closed could either get scuttled or expands. So this is a key de facto moment in the industry. What is a success yeah. number in your mind that kind of hits in terms of adoption to get that de facto momentum to where it's like a Kubernetes moment or a Linux moment or something significant de facto moment? Yeah, look, I think the pendulum has already swung. So I, I think th the future is this. Here's how I will say it. Those statistics that you shared, let me share one statistic about Databricks. 100% of the data in Databricks is in open source formats. So if you're using Databricks and do, you know, if you're using Databricks, you're doing some data processing. And that's not a big surprise. That data you're processing is an open source format. We simply don't have a proprietary one. We, we don't have any, other, there's no other alternative. There's nothing else. You cannot use Databricks unless you're using one of those. And 92% is in Delta Lake, the format that we have. And now with the Tableau acquisitions and this awesome team, we're able to with Uniform, Project Uniform, uh, unify the two so that you can actually now access both of them. So both become uh, accessible in Databricks. You just store your data in Uniform and it gives you both of those. So then well, how come some people have writes there but not reads there? If you read this way, it works. Well, okay, the existing industry before Databricks had this data platforms where you have to lock your data into them in the proprietary format. They're all being disrupted, okay? So of course, that disruption, there's two ways you can interpret that. You know, uh, if you want to give them the benefit of the doubt, uh, it just takes a while for them to shift all their platforms to be able to support the data that's out there. That's why they have, okay, read is only supported if the data is inside. If it's outside, we can only write to it. Uh, you know, um, if you want to have a more nefarious, uh, you know, interpretation, maybe they also are dragging their feet because, you know, it's a revenue headwind to move the data out of these systems. Uh, but they all kind of are now singing that tune that we're going to support iceberg, we're going to support lake houses, we're going to support open, uh, which then basically means the pendulum has swung. Even when the vendors that are being disrupted themselves are saying it, then you know this is going to be a future. So it's not a matter of if anymore, it's a matter of when. It's happening for us, it's already 100%. Yeah. I think this is just going to accelerate. So, so uh, I don't see any way for it to go backwards. The tabular acquisition, obviously, in my opinion, home run. We had Ryan Blue on, we interviewed him months and months and months ago. He took us through, it was last year actually, some of the great work that they did. It's not trivial, obviously, to unify you know, all these formats, but now you have uh, the, the team that can help you do that. What should we expect in terms of the technical challenges, the, the, the timeline? What has to get done, Ali, to actually bring together these open table formats? Yeah, hard to predict the future exactly. I would just say we now have uh, employees of Databricks that are the world's foremost experts on Delta Lake. The, some of the original creators of Delta Lake are you know, employed at Databricks. And now we have the original creators of Apache Iceberg as well at Databricks. So we have the experts in both. So if there's any team that can pull off, making them fully interoperable, it's a Databricks team now. Uh, I would say 
it's hard to know, but I would say within two years, in two years, hopefully you don't care. Like this distinction will be something that it's, it's, it's bare. It's like Betamax versus VHS or something. It's like, it's, uh, you know, most people don't even understand it because they weren't around so <laughs> a lot. in two years, I would say, right. So in two years, I would say that, uh, this distinction should matter right now in the present, they are different. Uh, so uniform is really the bridge that enables you get your cake and eat it too. And both of them work, but in two years, it shouldn't even matter which of the two you're picking. Um, of course, these are open source projects. There's open source communities around them. These are big communities. They don't all work at database, obviously. So we have to work with those communities and bring those formats together. That's, that's the work that's being done by the Tableau team and the Delta Lake team right now. It's hard work and you know they're heads down and working. And so far it's looking really, really good. Ali, you know, we've been saying at the beginning of this uh, SuperCloud 7 on the kickoff that this has been a table setting moment because all the actions on the infrastructure right now, silicon, um, hardware's booming, the speeds and feeds are getting there. And, but yet all the work on the lake side, that lake house on your end, there's a lot of stuff happening there that when that transitions over, that market and products will shift as well. So platform shift at the infrastructure level is going to enable a mass acceleration of data, platform, re-engineering, reset, whatever you want to call it. When do you see that happening? Absolutely. I mean, it's happening now, but like, when does it really kick up into a growth where it's like everyone's flipping the script? Because what you're saying, what we're talking about here is to set the table for Gen, Gen AI, you've got to change the entire platform. Yeah. And that's yeah, what's I mean, coming. Look, yeah, look, Gen AI needs data, all of the data. The more data, the better, right? There might be signal in that data and it can figure it out. So, you know, these models are trained, you know, 10 trillion tokens or, you know, roughly words or 15 trillion tokens and so on. Uh, so they need, the more data, the better. So you want to break those silos and you want to have all your data. That means you need a lake house approach, right? And you need to figure out the governance because the privacy and security of that data is really important then you can focus on these Gen AI applications. And for the Gen AI, I think we've come pretty far just in the last few years on how do I answer questions that require general intelligence, right? They talk about AGI, artificial general intelligence. How do I answer general intelligence questions, right? Tell me about physics. Tell me worldwide, you know, World War II history, okay? That's general intelligence. That's great. I think we've come far with that. But most of the valuable data is inside enterprises and that's private, confidential and that's where the real value, that's, those are all the enterprises that are providing you know, all the GDP growth. Uh, how do we actually answer questions on that data? That's where this lake house is needed. And that's what we call data intelligence. When you can answer truthfully on that data with privacy and security. That revolution, I think we're just embarking on it right now. Uh, I think over the next two, three years, we're going to start seeing yeah. applications which are really, really good at leveraging this proprietary confidential data that the enterprise has. Uh, and that's, I think that's where we're going to start seeing those generative AI applications that are going to be completely game changing. It's not just chatbots, yeah. it's not just for search, but it's everything from medicine to education to retail, you name it, in every industry, you're going to see data and AI become front and center of each of those. So I would say give it two, three years, we're going to start seeing some really amazing results. Finally, we already see the early innings of that. Finally, data as the asset being programmed, developers are in charge, open source is driving it. Ali, great stuff. Thanks for coming on. Real quick, final question. How's business? You guys going to go public? You got monster financing round you just did. You're still private. Give us a quick uh, plug for Databricks. What's going on with the business? Yeah, I mean, we had a phenomenal Q1 that uh, we just closed and then Q2 soon, hopefully closed as well. We're seeing the same momentum. So we saw an acceleration in growth. If you look at our year over year growth numbers, it's been accelerating. So, you know, Q1 when we closed it and a year, year over year revenue basis was, you know, um, upper mid 60s percent. Uh, so, you know, phenomenal growth. Uh, so we're seeing huge demand. Why is that demand? We think one, people want to lower their costs. So the lake house and the open formats, check that box. And the second, they want AI and they want Gen AI. And they know at Databricks they can get data intelligence. So AI on their data. So we have a lot of tailwinds right now. And so we're very excited. So it's, it's looking good. Uh, of course, everybody's nervous. There's a lot going on macro in the world. So we're paying attention to that. When are we going to IPO? When the time is right, we will do it. It's funny you said that you're paranoid like Andy Grove. Let chaos reign, reign in the chaos. <laughs> Ali, congratulations to you and your team. And again, always great to chat with you. You've been a CUBE supporter from day one and we really appreciate that. Thanks for supporting our event and giving the keynote. And again, the data points, great to you guys. So thanks for coming on. Thanks, Ali. Thanks, John. Okay, it's my well, pleasure. Ali Gatsi with Databricks, CEO. Man, what a transformation. 
15 years ago, Hadoop was the magic. Now it's all about generative AI. Data, the big data revolution is finally continuing to happen. Stop being now, Dave. More here at SuperCloud 7 after this short break.